The disrepair and overpopulation of many American cities in the 20th century gave way to the growing discourse around urban renewal projects as a way of improving the quality of life and eliminating many of these issues that arose in these cities. The southwest region of Washington, D.C., located south of the Mall and north of the Potomac River, was especially worthy of such attention for a variety of reasons. While the redevelopment of this area in the 50s and 60s was introduced as a solution to its problems, it instead wrecked the sense of community and collective memory in the area. This is the story of how policy, population, and propaganda changed Southwest D.C. forever. Following the conclusion of the United States Civil War in 1865, thousands of freed slaves filed out of the South and into the nation's capital to begin their new lives. The Southwest Quadrant of Washington, D.C. in particular quickly turned into a settlement for these freed blacks, as well as a variety of poor white European immigrants who could not afford to live elsewhere in the city. To house the rapidly growing population at the turn of the century, structures called alley dwellings were erected in between buildings in small back streets throughout the area. These substandard residencies were filthy and dilapidated and often lacked basic amenities such as electricity, central heating, and indoor plumbing, but they provided affordable shelter for the city's poorest tenants. Seen here is a map of the city that illustrates the relatively low number of these inhabited alley dwellings that existed in Southwest, outlined in red, in 1858, prior to the end of the Civil War. Immediately following the war's culmination, however, these makeshift homes began to rapidly multiply throughout the district, as more and more freed slaves and European immigrants poured into the area looking for inexpensive places to settle and find work. From 1871 throughout 1927, alley dwellings proliferated in large numbers and provided homes for many. However, their noxious conditions became of increasing concern of the Board of Health. Despite this fact, historian Keith Melder described this era in Southwest as its golden years. The area's inhabitants were determined to establish their own vibrant, self-sufficient community, though it was undeniably economically depressed. They had shops, restaurants, theaters, churches, and music parlors where, though somewhat segregated, whites and blacks civilly coexisted. Former residents of the area expressed how their isolation from other neighborhoods increased the convivality and cooperation throughout their community and its struggling business economy. But Southwest had uh, the, 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 the smaller clubs, the boats. We had the, the Wilson line. Everybody knew everyone in the vicinity. Uh, children were free to go in and out of any house and the mothers weren't worried because they knew they were being taken care of. I remember how delighted we were when we found that we had our own our, uh, hamburger place. That yeah, was brand new for Southwest. A fellow named Bill ran it, Bill's Grill. The sense of interracial collectivity between neighbors in Southwest D.C. was not enough to keep the area safe and livable, livable forever though. The unsanitary living situations continued to get worse over time and eventually it came to the point when they could no longer be ignored. Deaths and diseases engulfed the area as buildings decayed and properties were neglected. Ideas for solutions to these problems began to circulate, leading to an increase in the government's attention to these problems. In 1942, Arthur Goodwillie proposed the first considerable solution for the depleted housing problem of the Southwest by recycling current low-income affordable housing structures for new migrants. Congress ultimately decided against it because the plan did not consider D.C.'s rapidly booming population. It wasn't possible to rebuild housing for the existing population when they were pressed for the demand to accommodate an incoming flux of migrants. Although Goodwillie's plan was denied and thus not executed, his attempts for redevelopment served as a starting point for the preceding plans to come. Renewal remained a topic of discussion on Capitol Hill for the next few years, and in 1945, Congress passed the District of Columbia Redevelopment Act as a means of regulating the city's own redevelopment practices. The act also established the Redevelopment Land Agency, known as the RLA, as the body to mandate slum clearance throughout the Capitol area. These actions continued to progress development change throughout the D.C. quadrants. However, major momentum was established a few years later through the Housing Act of 1949. This decision provided easier access to federal funding for renewal projects that claimed to be combating perceived urban blight and suburban flight with efficient modern housing. At the mid-century mark, the RLA surveyed the District of Columbia to find its problem areas and realized that the Southwest Quadrant was in duress need of redevelopment. It took high priority over the rest because of the 3,370 buildings in the area, only 4% of which were in good condition, while 40% were obsolescent and 56% were blighted. 
Almost immediately after Southwest was declared the first site for federally funded redevelopment in the nation's capital, urban planners and architects began proposing designs for the area. Just as Goodwillie had done 10 years prior, these planners drafted construction strategies to improve living conditions and overall neighborhood well-beings throughout the land clearance and redevelopment for the 400-acre area. By the end of 1952, the National Capital Planning Commission had two plans to consider. Louise Justament and Cloethiel Woodward Smith were the minds behind the Justament Smith plan, which reflected the ideas that the area's potential was greater than simply rehabilitating its original makeup and low income minority based community, like Goodwillie had suggested. This plan instead sought to revitalize the area by luring the wealthy back into the city from outside suburbs, which would generate higher tax revenues and stimulate the commercial market in the area. The second plan for consideration was the work of an architect by the name of Albert Peets. His proposal, on the other hand, was intended to accommodate residents across a range of income levels. The both plans introduced key concepts to be used in the redevelopment of Southwest they individually lacked what the NCPC was looking for. The Planning Commission solved this problem by hiring a man by the name of Harlan Bartholomew to fuse these two plans into the ideal strategy. His plan, which was officially selected in 1952, was said to be a fair balance between the two extremes of the other plans. However, scrutinizing the fine print reveals that this plan aligned in large part with the Justament Smith plan that lacked consideration of low-income housing. While Bartholomew stated that the survey area should be redeveloped predominantly as a moderate to lower income residence area, a closer look at his plan's reprediction for housing construction shows he was never concerned with the likes of those poor residents. This table shows that of the proposed plans, all of them but pizzas did not allocate a single dwelling unit specifically to low-rent tenants, including the plan Bartholomew proposed and the version of his plan that the NCPC officially adopted. Both federal and private funding were already available and all developers needed to do was convince the Southwest residents of their empty promises. The Southwest Quadrant was sectioned into two areas, Area B and Area C, as two separate phases of construction. The project was designed to begin in Area B because it was a manageable size, but more importantly, because it was the center of blighted alley dwelling neighborhoods such as Dixon's Court, one of the capital's most notorious alley dwelling communities. The Area B covered 76.6 acres on the northeast corner of the quadrant and housed approximately 5,100 predominantly black residents before construction. The plan for Area B was advertised as being primarily residential, including 750 to 900 new dwelling units with a few commercial facilities in the neighborhood. Planners ensured residents that they would be accommodated during construction, that there would be no discrimination by race when selecting new tenants, and at least a portion of the new units would be offered at an affordable price for low-income families. However, reflection shows that behind the scenes, these planners had alternative intentions. But with no apparent reason to object these supposed guarantees, residents acquiesced and land acquisition for this initial stage began in December 1953. While for the most part developers were able to avoid major resistance from residents, there were few local business owners who objected to the RLA's use of eminent domain. Max Morris, a department store owner, and Goldie Schneider, a hardware store owner, both ran their businesses on 4th Street, the once vibrant commercial promenade in Southwest that was included in the land parcel to be cleared. Though the majority of this designated area was considered blighted, these store owner structures were not deemed substandard or deteriorating. For this reason, these shopkeepers took the RLA to the District of Columbia Circuit Court to challenge them with the claim that taking the properties was unnecessary for the purpose of slum clearance because they were not blighted and regardless, the redevelopment was intended primarily to benefit the private companies that would take control of their land. The District Court concluded that slum clearance by itself was insufficient to give a project public use and that the end use of the property, not just the elimination of blight, had to advance public purpose. While this opinion of the district court appealed to the plaintiffs, the court did not overturn the statue in question because the problem was the validity of the statue and not the validity of the RLA's implementation of the statue as applied to them. The redevelopment plan stood because the court did not overturn the statue. The decision was quickly appealed by both parties and which was then sent to the Supreme Court for reconsideration. There, unlike in the district court, the Supreme Court justices tried the Berman v. Parker case swiftly and with a lack of scrupulous consideration of the constitutional questions at hand to come to the conclusion that the District of Columbia Redevelopment Act was constitutional and that plans for Area B would resume as calculated. 
The rhetoric of the court's decision strongly reflected the City Beautiful movement, a philosophy that stood at the core of urban planning at the time and focused more on the beautification of cities rather than their attention to improving substandard properties for the sake of their low-income residents. While the lower court, on the one hand, carefully considered how urban renewal could advance health, safety, and welfare of local residents, the Supreme Court did not do the same to the same degree. In their decision, they wrote, The concept of public welfare is broad and inclusive. The values it represents are spiritual and physical, as well as aesthetic and monetary. It is within the power of the legislature to determine that the community should be beautiful, healthy, spacious, and clean. In the present case, the Congress and its authorized agencies have made determinations that take into account a wide variety of these values. It is not for us to reappraise them. If those who govern the District of Columbia decide that the nation's capital should be beautiful as well as sanitary, there is nothing in the Fifth Amendment that stands in the way. The Supreme Court case has been in, in law school casebooks. Uh, they went a long way. They have given the government, and, and probably state governments too, a carte blanche in any area of the country to take any property uh, for uh, almost any reason. Once they decide the taking, whether to beautify the area, uh, whether to clear slums, uh, for many, many reasons, uh, they could take it, condemn it, and they say your only right is to just compensation under the Fifth Amendment. While it may seem plausible that the establishment of new regulatory policies and agencies for redevelopment in the capital were put in place to oversee that it would serve the public interest, this was hardly the case. The new legislation passed through acts and reiterated through the decision of Berman v. Parker instead fueled the ability of developers to scheme up plans for slum clearance and land use that were much different than the ones they promised. With mounting support from the government, they were able to preach a plan that would accommodate the existing low-income population without ever including a single rep representative figure of this in their written plans. Throughout the rise of redevelopment, residents were led to believe that these housing plans were intended to make their quality of life better. It wasn't until the area was wrecked and residents of Southwest were displaced without any help from the RLA during their relocation that they realized they'd been deceived. The Southwest Citizens Association spoke on behalf of the pre-renewal community and expressed their discontent and feelings of betrayal. Representatives stated, this is a far departure from the original goal of redevelopment. Citizens understood the desire to build a more beautiful city, but not to the extent that it would be of benefit to only some, not including them. After this transition of focus, the community as well as the racial demographics of the Southwest Quadrant had changed dramatically. Income was the defining factor in the displacement of the community, and unfortunately, blacks and European immigrants were not on the high end of the income bracket during this time. By the end of this project, as well as other developments in major cities, it was apparent that urban redevelopment was designed to open real estate, increase economic value, and bring wealthier people into the areas, rather than actually address the issues of housing and blight. Thus, some associated redevelopment with Negro removal, as stated by civil rights activist James Baldwin. In reflection, the urban renewal movement was a social failure. At the time, reports showed that 515 families were tracked to have eventually moved to standard housing. They neglect to mention the thousands of residents and businesses that were inevitably displaced due to the raise in cost of the property. Families did not end up moving to other neighborhoods because they could not rebuild the sense of community like they once had in the Southwest District. Nature just seems to make things look a little better in retrospect. And I think there are many of us who look back at the nice things of Southwest the same way our parents look back at the good old days in the 90s. The good old days weren't good and everything in Southwest wasn't good either. But it was a friendly place. It was a place where all of us knew each other. And we very seldom managed to surprise each other. And there was a lot of helping, caring, and sharing, although not quite as much as some people want you to believe. When it got through, practically everyone in Southwest in the redevelopment area, in fact, everyone in the redevelopment areas was moved out. And uh, very few of those who were there originally could afford to come back, unless they qualified for public housing or had some very fancy incomes. Whether or not this is what planners originally intended is unclear. Although no federal program states that they purposely contributed to racial segregation and the marginalization of the poor, the way the Southwest Urban Renewal Plan was adver advertised did not mirror what was eventually completed. Skepticism of this engendered the idea that policies were skewed in favor of the wealthy white developers and corporations. 
Some responded to Southwest redevelopment with the belief that it was done to enhance the overall well-being of this booming city, while other, another more commonly held sentiment rested in how these plans destroyed a diverse and happy community that was predominantly colored. The control that the redevelopment supporting city elite had over the documentation of this piece of urban renewal record, in terms of its true intentions and implementation, caused for the blurring of its historical clarity and the collective memory of the community that once lived there.